Julia Morgan Built a Castle, written by Celeste Davidson Manis, illustrated by Miles Hyman. Julia Morgan Built a Castle. To my dad, a long distance streamer, C D M. For my children, Juliet, Charlotte, and Elliot, M H. Julia Morgan loved to build. Born in 1872, Julia was raised in the small California town of Oakland on San Francisco Bay. Little Julia preferred jumping on the trampoline in her family's barn and chasing her brothers to playing with dolls and having tea parties. As she grew older, lessons and chores filled Julia's week, but weekends were made for adventure. The Morgans ferried across the bay to San Francisco where shiny new cable cars climbed the hills and buildings sprang up like weeds. Julia's father was an engineer who knew how all sorts of things should be built. He enjoyed taking the family on tours through construction sites. Buildings were huge puzzles. Julia wanted to know how everything fit together. Sometimes the Morgans traveled across the country, not just across the bay. When they did, Julia visited her cousin Pierre Lebrun, a busy New York architect who designed and directed the building of graceful stone churches, sturdy brick firehouses, and one of the very first skyscrapers in Manhattan, the Metropolitan Life Insurance Tower. Cousin Pierre had the most exciting job in the world. Julia dreamed of becoming an architect. Architecture combined the study of engineering with special training in the art of building design. But only a few faraway schools taught architecture in those days. So Julia entered the nearby California University of California at Berkeley in 1890. There she studied engineering, the only woman in her class, and learned all about the buildings excuse me, and learned all about how buildings were constructed and why. There were so many parts to the puzzle. How do earthquakes, wind, and gravity twist, push, and pull at a building? How is a building anchored to the ground so it doesn't topple? How do columns and beams carry the weight of walls and roofs? When should concrete or steel, wood, or brick be used? Bernard Maybeck, Julia's favorite teacher, helped her put the pieces together. He taught math, but he was an architect too. Just like cousin Pierre, he believed that buildings should be as beautifully designed as they were practical and strong. Both men had studied at the greatest school of architecture in the world, Ecole des Beaux-Arts, which means School of Fine Arts in Paris, France. After she graduated in 1895, Julia went to work for Maybeck. She studied his designs for everything, from rustic hillside cottages to grand university lecture halls. Maybeck's buildings were planned for the way people would live and work and move within them, but they were also made to inspire like a magnificent painting or a stirring piece of music. Julia longed to attend the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, and learn more, but that would be not that would not be possible. The school only accepted men. Several months later, a rumor swept through Maybeck's studio. The Ecole, have you heard? They may soon open their doors to women. Soon wasn't soon enough for Julia. She packed her trunk and raced cross country by train from New York she boarded a steamship to France. Paris filled Julia with wonder. She marveled at the Roman ruins of Luce, the grinning gargoyles and flying buttresses of Notre Dame and Gustave Eiffel's infamous iron tower. She saw beauty in the pattern of rooftops and church spires on the horizon 
the glint of gold atop a pyramid she spied from the gardens of the Tuileries. Everywhere Julia went, she drew, sometimes in a sketchbook, sometimes on the back of an envelope, or even a scrap of paper. Soon Paris felt like an old friend. The École des Beaux-Arts, however, was not friendly. A woman study architecture, but why? The trustees of the École would not even let Julia take their entrance exam. She studied for it anyway at the ateliers or studios of two architects who also taught at the École. First, Marcel de Moncols and later Benjamin Chosmich. All the while, she practiced speaking and writing in French. On weekends, Julia visited museums and rambled through lovely small towns and villages. She explored King Louis XIV's Palace of Versailles, ornate Baroque theaters from the 1600s and soaring Gothic cathedrals over 800 years old. And as she explored, she could almost feel the ghosts of French kings and their royal architects whispering to her. Every building told a story. Weeks turned into months and months into a year. Julia moved from a hotel for women to a less expensive apartment on Rue Genougar. Many times she skipped meals to pay for books on architecture. Suddenly, in the autumn of 1897, the large iron gates of the École creaked open just a bit for Mademoiselle Julia Morgan of California. After a year and a half in Paris, she was allowed to take the school's long and difficult entrance exam. The École made Julia take the exam not once, not twice, but three times before she was finally accepted into their architecture program in October of, 19, of 1898. She was 26 years old. At the École, Monsieur Mazot showed three-dimensional pictures with his stereo, stere, sorry, stereopticon as he spoke about the history of architecture. Monsieur Mondut described how buildings were constructed from the inside out down to every last detail. There were countless math courses, countless drawing courses. Julia could hardly wait to start designing buildings. When she did, she remembered all the beautiful buildings she had explored and studied. Julia won a first prize medal for her final project, an opulent palace theater decorated with statues of characters from Greek mythology. The prize was announced just after her 30th birthday in the spring of 1902. That year, Julia became the first woman in the history of the École des Beaux-Arts to receive a certificate in architecture. After six years in France, Julia came home in 1904. She opened an atelier in San Francisco as California's first licensed woman architect. A flurry of requests to design homes, many for school friends, was followed by a commission from Mills College in Julia's hometown of Oakland. Julia designed a lofty bell tower for the campus using steel reinforced concrete to make it strong and more resistant to fire. But some doubted Julia's methods. It's too expensive. The walls are too thick. What does a woman know about building anyway? In April of 1906, an enormous earthquake and fire ripped through the San Francisco Bay Area. Thousands died. San Francisco was all but reduced to rubble and ash. Julia's office was destroyed, but her bell tower stood, as did every other building she had designed. Julia didn't give it much thought. There was a city to rebuild. Now everybody knew about Julia Morgan. She had completed, completed over 450 projects by the time William Randolph Hearst walked into her office one afternoon in 1919. A very rich, very powerful newspaper publisher, 
Hearst had grown up in San Francisco, just across the bay from Julia. Though he now lived in New York, every summer he came back to Central California to camp on some land he owned in the Santa Lucia Mountains, just above the village of San Simeon. Miss Morgan, said Mr. Hearst, we are tired of camping out in the open at the ranch in San Simeon. I would like to build a little something. What kind of home would suit Mr. Hearst perfectly? Julia imagined a dramatic show place where he could entertain both movie stars and presidents and display his huge collection of antique treasures. Ideas blossomed into rough sketches, then careful drawings and watercolor renderings. Mr. Hearst was delighted. Julia prepared plans, details, and models for a large main house to crown the highest hill and three smaller guest houses to hug its side. She also designed lush gardens and walkways to connect the buildings and giving the project the look and feel of a dreamy hilltop village. But there was much to do before construction could begin. The road up the hill was a cattle track and railroads were too far away to deliver supplies. The new road was built and Mr. Hurst's dock, San Simeon, enlarged so materials could be sent in by ship. Soon, trucks and horse-drawn wagons hauled lumber, iron bars, and tons of cement up the untamed hills. Bulldozers, cranes, and rock crushers quickly followed. Workers swarmed to San Simeon, strong men to provide heavy labor, and artisans such as carpenters, plasterers, stone casters, and wood carvers. Tents, then dormitories, were provided for them, cooks hired to feed them. Still, it was lonely on the hill. Julia Morgan made certain the men had a movie to watch on the weekends. The top of the hill was leveled with dynamite while other areas were pounded flat by teams of horses. Foundations were laid to connect the framework of buildings to the ground. Then walls were erected with concrete poured layer by layer into wooden forms laced with steel rods. Pipes, electrical wiring, door and window frames were set into the walls. Slowly the building began to rise against the hillside. Walls were finished with limestone and cast stone. A teak wood cornice carved with gargoyles decorated the exterior of the main building, La Casa Grande. Mr. Hearst purchased antique ceilings, mold, uh, ceilings, moldings, and fireplace mantles from Spain. Julia designed tiles and stained glass windows. While she worked on Mr. Hearst's castle, Julia Morgan finished hundreds of other projects for other clients. But come Friday night, she caught the coast train south from San Francisco to San Luis Obispo, and then took a taxi the last 50 miles to San Simeon. Julia usually arrived just in time for a quick nap before breakfast. She made this exhausting trip over 500 times. Weekends were spent walking the site, meeting with contractors and craftsmen, revising plans and discussing the project with Mr. Hurst. For many years, Julia worked out of a shack propped against the side of La Casa, La Casa Grande. Not everything went according to plan. Once Mr. Hurst had a chimney torn down and moved, then torn down again and put back exactly where it was to begin with. Another time after Julia remarked on the lovely view from the roof of La Casa Grande, Mr. Hurst asked her to add a third story to the house. Right away, other additions included, uh, sorry. Mr. Hurst asked her to add a third story to the house right away. Other additions included a glamorous red velvet movie theater, an airstrip and a zoo. And then there was the Neptune pool, a lovely Roman style pool overlooking the sea, which Julia was asked to redesign five times in 12 years. 
Julia Morgan certainly understood Mr. Hurst's passion for building. She shared it. But when Julia disagreed with her flamboyant client, she wasn't afraid to say so. Perhaps that's why William Randolph Hearst, one of the most outspoken and influential men in America, trusted Julia Morgan more than just about anyone. Julia spent more than half of her almost 50-year career working on Mr. Hearst's dream home in the hills above San Simeon. Construction finally stopped in 1947, 28 years after it began, but the castle Julia Morgan built tells her story to this day. And these are some pictures of Hearst's castle, the home that Julia Morgan built for William Randolph Hearst. There's the Neptune pool. It turned out pretty nice. And here you can see the front of the castle. There is the dining room. And there you can see the castle from afar. Pretty incredible. Julia Morgan really knew her stuff.